starte, så det gjør vi. Eh, jeg er Dio Skogrø. Eh, kjempekult at så mange av dere kunne komme på Rød Lunsj, hvor vi i dag har fått professor Stig Thiel hele veien fra Australia til å komme av, må jeg komme inn, må jeg komme inn, til å komme av og prate for oss. Han er helt uten sammenligning den eh, innlederen vi har hatt som har reist lengst for å prate med oss. Nå skal vi helt ærlig si til at han ikke bare har kommet til Norge for å prate for oss. Det var mer som at vi hadde veldig flaks eh, og at han skulle innom Trondheim en tur. Eh, vi setter utrolig pris for at han skal prate for oss. Det skal få en litt grunnig, grunnigere introduksjon av Steve Keen etterpå. Eh, av en som kjenner han enda bedre enn eh, det jeg gjør. Eh, først så vil jeg si at nå Altså, litt så går det praktisk. Han kommer til å prate i sånn cirka 40 minutter. Etter det så kjører vi rett på med spørsmål. Eh, en del korte, ikke, ikke alt for lange innlegg, innspill dere måtte ha. Og fordi at dere som har vært på Rød Lunsj før, så er det altså sånn at vi kjører et opplegg. Vi vet at det er en del folk som ikke er så glad i å stille spørsmål i store forsamlinger. Og dette er faktisk, det er ganske mange, så dette tenkes som en stor forsamling. Så da er det mulig å sende inn eventuelle spørsmål til dette mobilnummeret, og så vil det bli stilt under altså, diskusjonsdelen. Eh, yes. Før vi starter med en grunnig introduksjon av Steve Kim, så er det sånn at eh, dere har skrevet fått med at vi har fått en, en ny regjering. En, en veldig blå regjering, en blå-blå regjering faktisk. Eh, og vi som arrangerer Rød Lunsj, rett studentene, vi synes ikke om det. Eh, det, det, det. Det skal vi være ærlig på. Eh, det gjør heller ikke fagbevegelsen. Og nå er det sånn at vi har fått eh, NTL som organiserer alle studenter til å komme hit i dag og holde et par minutter innlegg om hvorfor det er viktig at dere som studenter organiserer dere i fagbevegelsen, spesielt nå som vi har fått Siv og Erna i forutsetteren. Du starter med det. Vær så god. Yeah, he, he, he's uh, he accepts that. 
<laughs> Thank you. My, my, my English language students often complain that I talk too quickly for them. So uh, I'm quite willing to be told I'm going too fast for this audience. And uh, Trun's, the, the, Trun mentioned the, uh, getting the Revere Award. There's a bit of history to that, and that is that the, the Real World Economics Review, which has uh, continued the protests against autistic economics that was begun by some French students back in 2000, in many ways, the French students had a great idea and they didn't know what to do, so it completely petered out. But one very energetic, actually American expat doing a mature age PhD in England called Edward Fulbrook continued producing what he called the PACON newsletter and then the Real World Economics Review, and is now what's called the World Economic Association. And Edward, uh, I'm, I'm getting on in news, I'm now 60. Edward is 75. He's done all this stuff for free all the way through the last pretty much one and a half decades. And he now, of course, has to consider slowing down and retiring. So the World Economic Association is trying to raise money from members to actually continue protesting against autistic economics and developing a, a realistic approach to economic theory, including the broad spectrum of approaches of non-orthodox, non-neoclassical economics. So I'd really urge you to take a look at that appeal that's going out on the Real World Economics Review shortly for membership to be able to pay somebody to do what Edward's done for free for the last one and a half decades. That's a bit of history there. Um, the award itself followed on a previous award which was called the Dynamite Award, which is given, we actually, it was originally thought of calling it the Ig Nobel, like the reverse of the Nobel Prize, because you, you know there is no such thing as a Nobel Prize for economics. You, You've heard of the Nobel Prize? Its full title is the prize in honour of Alfred Nobel awarded by the Swedish Central Bank. Because there was, there, it was, there was no such thing as a science of economics back when Nobel invented his prizes. And I don't think there's such a thing as a science now either. There's a set of competing religions which in terms of how they behave are, in my opinion, rather like air physics before Copernicus before observation and empirical realism dominated how science developed. Um, but they call it a science. And of course, you wouldn't be thanking meteorologists for destroying New York. But that is effectively what economists did by not predicting the financial crisis. In fact, they said, everything's fantastic. The normal forecast given by economists prior to the crisis breaking out. Um, my favorite comes from the uh, the OEC, no, the, yeah, the OECD outlook. And in May of 2007, published in June, the chief economist said, our central forecast remains indeed quite benign. That was two months before the crisis formally began, which we date, most people date these days from the Lerman Brothers collapse, which was in August of 2008. But in August of 2007, the Banque Nationale de Paris shut down three funds it had which were exposed to the subprime market because they said they simply couldn't value these bonds anymore. They were so-called AAA. And these days I have a little joke. I say, somebody says, it's triple. I say, is it AAA or can I trust it? Well, that was the beginning. And, and by December, December, January, the National Bureau of Economic Research recorded America was already in a recession. So to say it starts when Lerman Brothers collapsed eight months later, I think is just populism. The real date begins in August of 2007. Now, about that time, the Real World Economic Review said they wanted to give an award to commemorate not the science of economics, but the destructive force of economics by not warning about the crisis and in fact encouraging a whole range of so-called reforms that make capitalism more unstable and more prone to crises. So our first suggestion was to call it the ignoble award for economics. And we then got contact, connected, uh, contacted by the Ig Nobel Committee because there is actually, as you may be aware, there is an set of Ig Nobel Prizes. Have you seen that? You should take search for Ig Nobel, I-G-N-O-B-L-E, I think, or it might be I-G-N-O-B-E-L. And those are prizes for the most abs absurd and stupid contributions to science in the previous year. Satirical and quite funny. Well worth looking up. So they said, you can't use Ig Nobel and then we're discussing, as I'm part of the Real World Economics Review uh, editorial board, 
and we were discussing what else to call it. I said, why not call it the Dynamite Award? Because you know why Nobel invented the Nobel Prizes, do you? This is, I, I could be wrong on this story, but the, the story goes he had a brother who died in Russia and the newspapers incorrectly thought that he himself had died. So they published his obituaries, which said he was responsible for more deaths than anybody in human history, a scourge, and we would be better off without him for inventing dynamite. So to restore his own reputation, he decided to create these four prizes, including the prize for peace, of course. And now when you talk about Nobel, you think about a noble person. But in fact, the, the, so we used the dynamite link and awarded the dynamite prize. And that was to go to the three economists who did most to blow up the global economy in 2007. Now from memory, can you guess who some of the winners might have been? There were three potential candidates. Can you guess? Alan Greenspan, <laughs> okay? I think Ben Bernanke, and I think Milton Friedman got a posthumous award. So having done that, we then said, well, how do we now promote the positive side? And the suggestion was made that uh, we call it the Revere Award in the sense of Paul Revere for a warning before the event occurred and therefore enabling something to be done. Of course, the warnings were made not just by me, but by a range of people and completely ignored. And what I want to do now is go into my presentation and talk a bit about this because economists are satirised as people, if you tell them something actually works in practice, they say, ah, but does it work in theory? Okay. <laughs> well, I want to show my facts first of all and then contrast that to the theory because um, conventional in neoclassical economics says that the level of private debt should have no impact upon the economy. And this is a quote from Ben Bernanke who was regarded as an expert on the Great Depression. And he's not an expert on the Great Depression. He is an expert on explanations of the Great Depression that are consistent with neoclassical theory. And since neoclassical theory says capitalism can't have endogenous crises, the only explanation he could give for the crisis occurring was the Federal Reserve did it. Okay? So he ruled out any other alternatives, including Hyman Minsky's approaches and Kindleberg, let alone, let alone Marx. So this is his argument saying, to, to reason to ignore Fisher's debt deflation argument, is that debt deflation only involves a redistribution from creditors to debtors and should have no macroeconomic impact. So here's a chart of that. The red line is the annual change in, in private debt in America, divided by GDP to, to, to calibrate it. And the blue line is unemployment. Now, for those of you who know your statistics, I get a correlation coefficient between the two of minus 0.95. That's about as close as you can get to one with empirical data if you're not working in genuine physics experiments. But that doesn't matter. It should be zero. So let's ignore it. Now, of course, when you take a look at it, there's a boom in the economy while the levels of private debt were rising from 2002 to 2007. But in fact, it goes back a lot further than that. Then a huge slump when the rate of change of debt went from positive to negative, and now a tepid recovery. But we can ignore all that because we know in theory it shouldn't matter. Okay. Notice also here that this period here where the red line falls below the dotted line over here, which is zero change in debt, actually goes negative. That is the first time since 1945 that the level of private debt fell in America. And it fell across about two years. And now you can see once more it's rising again. That's important about what we can expect to have happen in the near future. Now, <coughs> we also get told by conventional economic theory, who, who's doing an economics degree here? Okay. Are you still being taught the capital asset pricing model? Efficient markets hypothesis? Yeah. Well, you know that the debt and asset prices are unrelated, aren't they? Because if the firm takes out a certain level of debt, then the person buying the shares can be unlevered, or if the firm has 100% cash, or equity, then the person borrowing can be levered. So debt has no impact upon asset prices, which is why you don't see the correlation that you see here. <laughs> okay? Which is a correlation between the acceleration of mortgage debt, mortgage debt being housing loans, and it's looking at the rate of change of the rate of change of mortgage loans. And according to my theory, which is outside conventional economics, of course, change in debt drives asset prices or set, sets the level, therefore acceleration sets the change in asset prices. And over it, the last 15 years, I've got a correlation of 0.84. But we can ignore that because we know it doesn't matter in theory. 
And now when you take a look at what's happening in period, of course everybody's obsessing about the blue line, that's the ratio of public debt in America to GDP. They don't even consider the red line, which is the ratio of private debt to GDP. Notice the recession began here. It's still rising at that point, but I'll show it rising more slowly later. The rise in public debt occurs after the recession began. Everything's focusing upon that level. But the important thing to look at as well is the level of private debt is now starting to rise compared to GDP once more, which is the, the makings of another paper boom in the economy. So I expect to see a moderate recovery, but the Americans could destroy that with their current obsession about getting the, the government deficit down and the government shut down and all this nonsense stuff the Republicans are on with. On that front, I must say, I completely agree with Paul Krugman on that front. I fight Paul Krugman quite a bit, theoretically, on the, on the web, but I have great respect for what he's doing and fighting a regard action against the sheer madness that seems to dominate American politics. So, okay. And finally, let's look at the long-term trend. I've, I've recently put this data together working with uh, a group called the Governor's Woods Foundation in Philadelphia in America, a philanthropic organisation started by a person who was the person who originated credit cards in America. Unusual thing. America, as we see it as the, the, the great capitalist nation, it's got an amazing mixture of other cultures to it as well, one important part of which is philanthropic effort. And often what will happen is somebody will make an absolute fortune, and this person did, and then get interested in social issues and think, hey, I've got a couple of hundred million dollars to play with, I'm going to have fun. Uh, Richard's idea of fun is trying to investigate the real trail of private debt in the economy and publicise the data. So you get some un really unusual things happening in America. It's not a black and white country at all. So uh, with Richard's, I gave, helped Richard build the data series. His name is Richard Vague. Uh, Richard helped his group, Governors Woods, build the database of private debt and public debt in America going back as far as we can manage. It involves some hypothesised relationships because the data is not collected well. But this looks like the long-term pattern from 1830 through to today of level of private debt and public debt. Now, the red line is private debt. And as you can see, throughout except during wars, the level of private debt exceeds public debt. Civil War, the First World War, rising a bit, the Second World War. Okay. You can see downturns correlate in particularly big ones with where there's a decline in the level of debt. Now, the, there appears to be a rise here in the ratio, and there, there is a rise in the ratio during the Great Depression, but the reason was people were reducing their debt in nominal terms, but the actual GDP was falling even faster. So from 1930 on, private debt was falling, but GDP fell faster, so the ratio rose. That was the impact of deflation, in other words, in that period. And then again, here we are now. Now, one little aside at this moment, I've seen some new papers published by a neoclassical economist saying, of course nobody can predict a crisis. Okay. And that's the sort of thing you could say if you were an earthquake researcher, and you're saying, of course you can't predict an earthquake. Now, the thing is, we actually know what causes earthquakes. Okay. We know it's shifts in tectonic plates, we know it's fault movements and so on. So knowing all that, knowing the system, you can't predict an earthquake because so many non-linearities that we, we don't know enough about the detail to be able to say one's going to occur. And therefore they say, same thing in economic theory, we can't know what's going to happen. But if you leave out an essential element of capitalism from your model, which is private debt, as I'll be arguing today, then you can completely fail to see something coming when somebody who says private debt matters can say, watch out, at this level something has to happen. But that's the nature of the prediction that I made, and quite a few others as well. Starting in about 2005, I was making my warning saying, this exponential increase in the private debt ratio can't keep going on. When the rate of growth of debt slows down, there will be a crisis. And other people like Anne Pettifors in England, um, Michael Hudson, um, Wynne Godley, Randy Ray, quite a few others were making similar warnings about the level of private debt. So, but why does private, why do conventional theories say it doesn't matter? Why does the stuff you get taught 
any economic tools to say ignore it. Well, here's a, a longer quote from Bernanke saying that unless there's really big differences in how much debt is consumed versus creditors, there should be no impact from changing the level of private debt. And this is Paul Krugman. Now I'm going to start fighting Paul. Um, he's saying in his book, um, End This Depression Now, he's talking about what happens with lending occurs. He said, think of it this way. When debt is rising, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing more money. I'm going to prove he's right under one theory and wrong under another in a moment. And under his theory, it's true. When borrowing occurs, there's not more money. But in the theory that I use, there is more money. I want to confer the two. So you're seeing borrowing is just a case of less patient people borrowing from more patient people. And you can ignore banks. No mention of the word banks there. And then in a recent argument, uh, quoting a paper out by an old uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics, James Tobin, saying that uh, banks, the reason why banks don't matter, yes, commercial banks can make a loan simply by crediting the borrowers near deposits. So he's admitting that technical detail that's a major part of what I work on these days. He said, but, but this refutes all the nonsense about how the mechanics of lending make everything very, very different. So that's the position. Lending is between patient people and impatient people, and it has no effect on the macro economy. Now, so they therefore ignore bank set and money, and this is a more technical paper by Eggerston and Krugman where they go through saying, well, since the crisis occurred, everybody's talking about debt. And then, therefore, because of that, you'd think that debt plays a major role in economic theory. But he then admits that it is quite common to abstract altogether from this feature of the economy. And that's the nature of the economics. You're doing a course, so that's the nature of what you're being taught. Money, banks and debt don't turn up at all in the economics course. They might turn up in some fashion in a course which might be called financial institutions and management or something like that, but they won't turn up in your macroeconomics. Well, I want to compare the two. It's very important when you're fighting an alternative perspective to be able to put that perspective into a framework that lets you compare it with your own. And that's what I've done here. Um, so in the mainstream model is called loanable funds. There's people who have money to loan and they need to be given a high interest rate to attract them to actually put that money forward for borrowing. And there's people who wish to borrow money and the lower the rate, the more they're willing to borrow. And wow, isn't it amazing? They meet in two intersecting lines. So novel. You know, that's loanable funds. So in this model, the, in the paper that Krugman sets out, which is a new Keynesian, what they call dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. By the, sorry, if I... <laughs> Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium. That's the current fad. Has anybody read about those yet? Okay, any doing any master's degrees here or PhDs? Okay. They're the current fad in economics. In my opinion, they're not dynamic and they're not general. They're stochastic equilibrium models, but they dominate how they think you should model the economy now. Now, my alternative is what I call endogenous money, and it's, I'm not by far, far from the first theorist to write about that. And banks play a crucial role from the endogenous money point of view. And I want to quote somebody here, uh, making this case, not me, obviously, as you'll see in a moment. <coughs> He's talking about borrowing, saying borrowing from individuals is one thing. Borrowing from banks are different. Business can get extra borrowings. Okay? Not just what's available, but more than that, because banks, in return for an offer of higher interest, can let their ratio of reserves to liabilities decrease and therefore generate extra money, giving businesses more floating capital than they would, good, they would have got otherwise. And this says, whether warranted or not, this makes the supply of money more elastic. The author, Arthur Cecil Pigou, regarded these days as an arch-conservative economist and somebody Keynes derided in the general theory. Now, Pigou could say that back in the 1920s. Something went wrong in economics to lose that wisdom. And I want to now contrast the two using a software package I've developed with the help of a grant from the Institute for New Economic Thinking. You've all heard of INET? Okay. Uh, they gave me a grant of $128,000 back in 2010, I think. And I then got more money from a Kickstarter campaign. If anybody donated here, thank you. Um, to build this open source software. You can download it. I'll, I'll put this, send you the um, link later and you can download it for free 
install it on your computer. We have a Mac version, a PC version, and if you're a Linux hog, you can compile your own. Um, and it's a system dynamics program, which is like the software that Trun Andresen's department uses, Simulink, for modeling hydrodynamics and electric cars and a whole range of other technologies. I've adapted it for economic modeling by including what I call a godly table. And that's a tribute to Wynne Godley, who emphasized the need for monetary modeling and being balanced about it in economics as well. Because the financial flow is not like a, flow, a physical flow of, of fluid from one point to another. Um, you can do that with just one system state, as it's called. When you're modeling a financial flow, you have to say it goes from one account to another. So you have two what are called system states, and you have to change both of them at the same time. And secondly, they've got to have the signs coordinated. So if you take money out of one, you put it into another. Okay? You've got to get that right. That's very difficult to ensure with the flowchart paradigm that dominates existing programs. So I've added what I call a godly table, and that lets you do a double entry bookkeeping vision. So accounting is coming in here. Anybody here studying accounting? Nobody, okay, I didn't either. I'm learning it the hard way now. So assets are shown as a positive, and liabilities and equity are shown as a negative, and a source is a plus, and a destination is a minus. So if, you're, if you get more money in your deposit account, that means the bank has a bigger liability to you, so I show it as a larger negative number. That's the logic there. But you can also show it the way accountants are used to with debit and credit. I find their technology very confusing. So I'm going to model loanable funds now using Minsky, and that's going to be showing a patient agent lending to an impatient agent. I'm going to assume they're both capitalists. Because they're both capitalists, they're going to hire workers, produce output, and sell the output. And banks are just going to be mere intermediaries. Banks are simply whether one agent deposits the money. Okay? You basically ignore them in the entire analysis. So this is what it looks like. This is uh, the, the Minsky software with three bank icons in it. The, the big one here is the actual bank. This is the patient agent's view of the financial transactions, and that's the impatient agents. If I open up the bank block, and this is what I see. Can you read that at the back? I doubt that you can. <laughs> OK. This has uh, reserves, one column, which is an asset of the banking sector. And that's where the deposit of $100 or $100 million goes from the patient agent. Uh, the patient agent has $90 million in deposit, and the impatient agent has $10 million. And that's been because there's been a pre-existing loan by the patient agent to the impatient agent. Then I have the patient agent lending money the impatient agent paying interest, the impatient agent repaying the money they've borrowed, the patient agent hiring workers, the impatient agent hiring workers, the impatient agent consuming, the patient agent consuming, workers consuming uh, from both agents, and bankers consuming from both agents. Make sense? All ties together quite simply. And then I link the patient agents and the impatient agent's accounts to that. And because the patient agent, I think you might be able to see that more clearly, the patient agent has another asset. Having lent the money to the impatient agent, as well as having money in the bank, there's a debt the impatient agent owes to them. So there's the loans there, and there's lending and repayment shown there. And their equity, the, the, their net worth, is the inflow of money minus the payments they're paying out. And the same thing with the impatient agent. Um, has one asset and two liabilities I should have there. I'll edit that before I... Actually, I might as well do it now. OK. So there's the asset of the bank account, and then I'll put a, sort of li no, a liability and, and one liability. I got it wrong. Isn't that great? <laughs> Never edit stuff live unless you're ready for it. Pardon me. And yeah, dear. OK, this will go down well on YouTube. OK, the asset is the deposit, deposit the, the liability is the loan, and then the um, net worth, again, is the, the financial flows through their system. Now, I can then build the equations out of this program. So what Minsky does, as well as letting you simulate, can also say, what are the equations here in the sort of form you put into an academic paper? So Trun actually introduced me to a wonderful phrase called the MIGO effect. Ever heard of MIGO effect? You're about to experience it. My eyes glaze over. Okay? You see equations, people's eyes glaze over. 
those are the equations behind the model I've just shown you. Now, if I tried to read you through those equations, how many of you would now be snoring? <laughs> okay? But you follow the table moderately well, okay? So the table lets you look at this same logic without needing to see all that detail there. Now that's loanable funds. And the sum of all the money in those accounts, patient agent plus impatient plus the workers plus the bank, that's the total amount of money in the economy. And if you look at the rates of change of the amount of money, add them all up, you get zero. There's no change in the amount of money in the economy. Uh, so the amount of money is conserved, and using the, the, the lingo of dynamic systems, it's what's called a conservative system. There's two types of dynamic systems, conservative and dissipative. In a conservative, something is maintained despite transformations. In a dissipative system, nothing is maintained, things change. Well, let's just look. You go through and look at all the various forces and uh, elements here and look for pluses and minuses and check them all out, you find they all cancel. Okay? There's no roll, nothing changes at all in the total amount of money. Now the first two accounts are the amount of money in the firm sector, the patient agent plus the impatient agent. So that's, and the turnover of that is annual GDP. And if you look at that, lending and repayment disappear. To get rid of the entire, let's just check out the lending and repayment components. There's repay, there's lend, and there's interest. So again, you find nothing in the demand coming from the financial system. You can ignore the banking sector, you can ignore debt. So how does endogenous money differ from that? Well, if I had a lot of time, I'd actually try doing this live, but in case I made a mistake, I made a recording of myself doing it. And my bloody phone is going off, isn't that great? Who can this be, Tron? This is Tron's phone. I'll let you handle it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hang on a second. I'll just pause that, if I can. Is there a sound thing here? I bet I'm going to have to talk it through because I don't think you're going to hear the volume in my machine. Okay, what I'm doing here is grabbing elements in the model and changing them. So loans aren't an asset of the patient agent. I've just deleted loans, that column is gone. And I delete the two rows of lending and repayment here because there's the, no, the lending and repayment aren't going to the patient agent, they're going from the impatient agent to the bank. So I do that first of all. And then I change the initial amounts of money as well because I'm now going to have 90 being a deposit by the patient agent and 10 being loaned by the bank, not by the patient agent. So changing that around. Then I come to the bank. And I now add in an extra asset for the bank. Or change it. I'm changing the uh, amount of money first of all. I might actually make that full screen. No, I can't. Okay. Now I move the repayment and interest around. And notice the program is warning me I have an unbalanced row here and an unbalanced row there. This is the sort of double check the software does for you that is very, very hard to do for yourself. So I now added in loans, and it now says lending is between you and the bank. And then I'm have to tie up a few more rows. So I'll, I'll stop at that point. But what I've managed to do in doing that is move from this model to that model in about five or six operations. So all I'm saying is lending is from the banks to the non-banks. It's not from one non-bank agent to another non-bank agent. Well, what does that give me in terms of a difference? Well, here's the equations for endogenous money. Now, again, the same sort of story. The first four are money in the economy, and the rates of change do not sum to zero. If I just go through the cancellations here, you'll find the amount of money isn't conserved. Whether it rises or falls depending upon, depends upon whether lending is greater than or less than repayment. And it's therefore what's called a dissipative system in complex systems terms, not a conservative one. So here we go for our cancellations. And you can see lending and repayment is still there. They don't cancel out. And the firm sector, of course, is the first two. And what you'll find is that the amount of demand they're getting involves a change in the level of debt. But the level of debt directly affects the macroeconomy. And they play a crucial role in the economy. So 
and what a lot of people, and not just neoclassicals, get confused by, but even people in my own school of economics, post Keynesians, which I'm still trying to convince about this, they say, well, assets plus li equals liability plus equity all stands up to zero, doesn't matter. Well, that's true, because what you have is two linked, what are called dissipative systems, where nothing is conserved, which e equally offset each other. So to add together the money and the debt changes, you'll get zero. Okay? But separate them, they can both expand or contract. <coughs> so the reason we're leaving out this huge part of the dynamics of capitalism is by a fallacious idea about the capacity of debt to expand and cause more demand. Okay? When you include that, you get a totally different approach to macroeconomics. Now, if I simulate these two models, and I've done a simulation here. Let's bring it up here. So this is Minsky running live now. I'll make it a bit smaller so you can see all the boxes there. And I've got a control here over the lending and repayment rates. And if I drastically speed up lending, so you can see the red line of debt rises, and drastically slow down repayment so that it rises even further, Nothing happens to GDP. GDP is the horizontal line. And nothing happens to money either. That's also the horizontal line. So changing the details of lending is irrelevant to macroeconomics. That's why I say it's important to be able to put, even if you disagree with an approach, it's important to be able to put it in a context where you can express it. That's what I've done with that particular model. So if that was the nature of capitalism or of finance, you can ignore bank debt and money, and neoclassical would have been right. Now, what I've done with my model, those simple changes I showed you a moment ago, if I simulate that, let's bring up that Minsky model, you'll notice straight away that the level of money is rising without me making any changes. If I make lending more rapid or slower, if I speed up repayment or slow it down, I change not just debt, I change GDP as well. Okay. So the financial system, the creation of new loans dramatically changes the nature of capitalism. And by not having it in there, that's why neoclassical economists completely miss the crisis. So variations in what happened to the lending affects both GDP and debt, and you can't understand capitalism without including banks' debt and money in it, which is what I've written the Minsky software to do. So this brings me to financial instability hypothesis, which is the a way that Kun and I first met. I, I will not tell that embarrassing story later, you never know. Um, and that's about giving a macroeconomic view of endogenous money. And Hyman Minsky developed it. He integrated the views of Marx, Schumpeter, Fisher and Keynes and a few others and reached a conclusion which is very different to a lot of conventional critics of, 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 of capitalism. So if you read Baran and Sweezy, for example, they talk about a crisis of underconsumption. There's a tendency in Marxist analysis to see capitalism as tending towards stagnation. Minsky's perspective would say the fundamental instability of a capitalist economy is upward. The tendency to turn doing well into a speculative boom is the basic instability of capitalism. And of course that necessarily is tied up with increasing levels of debt. And he saw capitalism as being inherently flawed, far different to the, near, the equilibrium vision you get in conventional economics, but he said this instability is viewed as characteristics it must have to be consistent with full-blown capitalism. But not a case of saying you can get rid of these. And I believe you can attenuate them, but you can't get rid of them either. So yeah. you attenuate? You attenuate. You, you can reduce the impact, but you can't eliminate. Yeah, thank you. Please, if I say a word you don't understand, interrupt me like that. And if I say it too quickly, get this bastard to tell me to slow down. <laughs> okay. So, he said a financial system will be capable of generating signals that induce an accelerating desire to invest and of financing it. So, you've got to tie the whole thing together, which is what Minsky does. So, he starts with an economy in historical time. Now, history and time are both absent from conventional economic theory. You don't get a genuine treatment of time. You certainly don't get respect for history or economic history. But if you are in time, you know that sometime in the past there's been some debt-induced crisis in the economy. And my favourite example now is the 1990s recession, when Bill Clinton came to power. 
because after that crisis, both firms and banks are conservative about the amount of debt they'll take on. And this is not because one side has asymmetric information, which is the neoclassical way of thinking about it. Minsky said both sides have to share much the same expectations. Both are pessimistic after a crisis. Because they're pessimistic, the only project that get put forward are quite conservatively estimated ones. But because the economy is recovered, most of those projects succeed. And that leads people to think, oh, it pays to lever. The more the people who take on more debt did better. So the willingness to take on debt rises. And Minsky gets to talk about what he calls the euphoric economy, where expectations become positive because of, st of, of stable economic conditions. Now, for a while, that gives you less risk aversion, more investment, and the economy grows more rapidly. But it also means asset prices start to rise. And Norway's certainly having that effect in house prices, by the way, which makes it profitable to speculate. And there's the increased willingness to, to lend money increases the money supplies. I've shown you from the endogenous money point of view. So you get riskier investments, more of which are losing money. A large number of investments being taken on when people are optimistic are going to lose money. Therefore, they need to borrow more money later. Okay, keep on going. This leads to what Minsky called Ponzi financiers. Now, they're capitalists who have a cash flow from their investments, so-called, which is less than their debt servicing costs. So technically, they're bankrupt at all times. How do they survive? Well, they, they make a profit by selling assets on a rising market. But until they sell those assets, they have an insatiable demand for debt. They will not refuse an offer of a loan, no matter how expensive it may be. Because if they do, they go bankrupt the day after. So they drive up interest rates quite possibly. They force other people to sell assets as well because they're making everything more expensive. And ultimately, you get to the point where either the acceleration of debt slows down, that little factor I showed you earlier, or market interest rates rise, or the central bank tries to restrain a boom by putting up interest rates. Um, but ultimately, you get to the stage where the Ponzi's, who are necessarily losing money, can't roll over their debt. Bang, they start failing out of the blue. Those euphoric expectations investments fail. They collapse as well. And you then have often non-Ponzi investors trying to sell assets because they think it's a, a broad asset market and it turns out not to be that broad. The market collapses, prices fall, and you're back where you started again. The first ones to fail are the Ponzi's because they, they are bankrupt. Unless somebody gives them a new loan, they can't keep on operating. So as soon as they get refused a new loan, they fall. Asset prices collapse. The expansion of the money supply goes into reverse. Investment evaporates. And you're back where you started again. Now that's Minsky's basic cycle. Uh, if you have high inflation, then debts can be repaid by rising price level. And that's what happened back in the 1970s but you have stagflation, and you have a government sector, the government spending can also attenuate that. I won't show that because I haven't got enough time in this, in this talk, but I'll show you my mathematical model of Minsky. Now, the basis of this model is a, a, a two or three paragraphs in Chapter 25 of Volume 1 of Capital. Quite out of place because most of Capital assumes, Volume 1 of Capital assumes labour power is the real wage, but in this section he talks about the real wage being cyclical. And Richard Goodwin extended it to include debt. I'd include, um, to build a mathematical model of it, what I've done here is turn this into a simulation model. And I'll just quickly bring that up here to show it to you. This is again using Minsky, my software package to run a simulation. And what I have here is the level of, out of capital determines output, which <laughs> determines employment, which determines the rate of change of wages, which determines profit. If profit, if the desire to invest exceeds profit, firms borrow money, which gives them an interest payment bill. And then that causes change in the capital stock and on you go. And you run this model. And if you look at it, first of all, the employment rate appears to be stabilizing. Looking at that over time, the great moderation. But the great moderation starts to break down after a while. You go from diminishing cycles to increasing cycles. And what's actually happening over here 
is a rising ratio of debt to income, debt to GDP. And ultimately you go through a breakdown. So that was the mathematical model that led Trun and I to uh, meet each other because he spotted a mathematical error in the type setting, not my equations, but the type setting of the equations in an academic paper. And I won't say what he said next when he found out he was right. Okay. Um, so what I've built now with Minsky, the, the model I've shown you a moment ago, I could have built in Simulink or VizSim or a whole range of other programs. What I can do with Minsky as well is include the money system. Now, the model I'm about to show you is incomplete. I know there's a logical error inside the model. I haven't yet properly incorporated stocks inside there. But if I simulate this model, I get something which is again empirically closer to what we experienced in 2007. Because if you look at this model, what I've got is diminishing cycles and then expanding cycle, boom and bust. What we actually experienced was boom with diminishing cycles and then a crash. So when I run this model, that's what I get. It's still incomplete, as I've said. I know there's an error in the logic, and I'm working on that right now with Tron's help. You get employment cycling appearing to get more stable, inflation slowing down as well, and then an exploding level of debt, and the economy collapses, which is the sort of logic we've been through. So, that's my attempt to get a intellectual handle on what we've been through as a crisis. What comes after the crisis? I have there are a few Star Trek fans there who get that reference. But not really a recovery, not life as we know it, because this is looking at the what I call the credit accelerator, and part of my logic argues that acceleration of debt drives change in economic behaviour. And the more debt dependent your economy is, the more extreme that it gets to be. This is looking at the acceleration of debt, the rate of change of the rate of change of private debt and unemployment between 2000 and uh, today. And you can see that the huge slump that occurred there precipitated the crisis. We've now got a revival going on, but the level of credit acceleration is already falling. So I think there'll be a short-term boom until that runs out of steam because of that one of those first charts I showed, we're still at a historically high levels of debt. We're still talking about a higher level of private debt now than at the peak of the Great Depression. So the attempts of the, the government sector to keep the whole thing rolling by reinstituting a dominant financial system, which is what they've done, okay, will work temporarily but fail because there's already too much debt. So we've got an unsustainable attempt to get out of an unsustainable problem by restoring the unsustainable trend that caused the problem in the first place. So I expect maybe two years of recovery before that all falls over. And effectively, we're turning Japanese. Japan did the same thing back in 1990. Two decades later, it's still in an enormous slump. Now, I cannot imagine Europe surviving two decades of what it's going through right now. Without fail, there'll be a fascist takeover at some point, given that sort of political system. But what about Norway? <coughs> well, I just recently got... Uh, there is one official organisation that got it right, called the Bank of International Settlements. That's the only official organisation that saw the crisis coming. There's a guy called Bill White, who was their research director, who's a great fan of Minsky. I would read Bill White's documents, expecting to laugh at a typical official document, and my jaw would hit the floor because I could have written what Bill wrote. Um, but the Bank of International Settlements now maintains data on private debt and house prices. So here's Norway's private debt situation. The dotted brown line is America's private debt. So you've got a bigger level of debt than America, and you had a big boom that began in 2008, reached a peak in 2009 and slumped, but you're still now running at a level of private debt about 30 or 40% higher than America's. So despite the oil strength of your economy and your manufacturing strength, you've got a debt issue here as well. Uh, you're not, but you're not as debt-driven as America. This is looking at the acceleration relationship uh, in America between debt acceleration and unemployment since from 1990 forward. You can see the power of the correlation there, 0.88, minus 0.88. If I put Norway's over the top, I still get the same sort of relationship but not as strong. A minus 0.43 rather than minus 0.88, a lot weaker. And that implies several things, particularly, I'm, I'm sure, your oil and your your, uh, the reserves you build up, financial reserves on that basis, and the manufacturing nature of your economy as well. 
uh, means you're not quite as badly affected by debt as America, but it's still an issue. And what about housing? This is your real housing price, again from the Bank of International Settlements. So real house prices in Norway have tripled since 1994. You guys thinking of buying houses one of these days? <laughs> Time you went and mugged your parents. Now, of course, that could be driven by fundamentals, as economists like to call things which they don't understand that they hope making everything work. Um, to me, if, it's, if there's correlation, a strong correlation between acceleration of debt and change in house prices, then what you actually have is a financial bubble driving your house prices, and it's your finance system you need to take on. And of course, we know the United States is a bubble. This is looking at the acceleration of household debt. I could actually narrow it down just to mortgage, but because the Bank of International Settlements data from Norway only gives me household debt as opposed to house loans specifically, I've just looked at um, mortgages, uh, household debt acceleration here and house price change in America. You can see the big slump in acceleration and the slump in house prices. Now recovery going on, now the debt's accelerating once more on the correlation of 0.7. So what's the Norway situation? 0.75. So I would say you have a housing bubble driven by finance debt. And you've got a reason to control your finance sector and take on the finance sector. So you fit the bill for a housing bubble. And what I've been talking about here has been emphasising the, the financial aspects of capitalism that are left out of conventional theory. And I want to show you I'm walking in very good footsteps here by talking about that. Who do you think said this? Talk about centralisation. The credit system, which has its focus in the so-called national banks and the big money lenders and usurers surrounding them, constitutes enormous centralisation and gives this class of parasites the fabulous power not only to periodically to spoil industrial capitalists, but also to interfere in actual production in the most dangerous manner. And this gang knows nothing about production and has nothing to do with it. Who do you reckon? This guy. <laughs> Uh, so please read Beyond Capital One. Okay? <laughs> That's in Volume 3, Chapter 33. Okay? There's lots to be learned by Marx about financial capitalism. The de Bruinhoff stuff about him having a goal theory of money is garbage. That is a deliberate decision he made in the first, mainly seven, pretty much the first 24 chapters of Capital One, just to simplify the issue. Much richer vision of money than you get out of the de Bruinhoff attitude. And on that note, I'll finish with a read about how do you read Marx, because... A lot of people read Marx in a very didactic way. They want to reach the, they want to support the conclusions Marx reached. But Marx was here to be bashing you up for doing that. But this is Marx talking about his own uh, inspiring teaching. He wasn't actually taught by Hegel, but of course he was a Hegelian philosopher. And he's saying, writing about Hegel in his own PhD thesis, it is conceivable that a philosopher could be guilty or this is that inconsistency because of this or that compromise. He might even be conscious of it. And I believe Marx was conscious of some of his own inconsistencies. What he's not conscious of is that he doesn't understand his own principles well enough. So if the philosopher really has compromised, it's the duty of his followers to follow the inner core of his logic, not the words, but his logic, to illuminate where he went wrong, and that he therefore get his progress in knowledge as well as a progress in conscience. And that doesn't involve criticising the philosopher. Okay? It involves taking what they understood and going beyond them. And that's how I think you should read Marx, because that's how he read his own predecessors. Thank you. I'm just going to switch over to yeah. Norwegian because I'm yeah, so sorry about uh, all the shoe now. Sepp, Sepp, still in the Like some bio data, but I'm very glad for the for the data model we have to simulate them and thing. For the data that the model is very 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 uh, vi har information, vi har sender ut sånne skjema hver gang vi har reverse. Det ene er at jeg vil ha information om neste gang det er reverse. Og det andre er at jeg vil bli med i Røst Lønnedag. Uh, det er ikke noe 
trenger ikke å skrive på noen av dem, men vi blir veldig glad hvis, hvis folk gjør det. Eh, så vil jeg at eh, folk som har spørsmål til Stig skal eh, ta på trekke på meg. Og så kan vi, så skal, ja, yeah. well, people have questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm asking to ask, uh, ask questions, and then you can answer them. Uh, sure. both instability and profit. There's, we, we often criticize capitalism as being unstable, but part of that instability is part of its creativity as well. It, so the instability that gives us innovation is, is one of the things which makes capitalism a very positive social system. And you'll find Marx talking about this, of course, in the Capitalist Manifesto. The dramatic transformation of production he saw up to 1844 has continued 1840, was that 1848? 1848 has continued well and truly on after them. And capitalism has far more successfully transformed production methods than any other social system in our history, except possibly Cro-Magnon society itself in the very early days. So that instability is not necessarily a bad thing. The bad instability is financial instability. Because if you instead, rather than getting people innovating new technologies, being like Elon Musk and you know building an electric car or a new rocket system for getting stuff into outer space, uh, Rather than doing that, if we have financial innovations creating what Warren Buffett very accurately called weapons of mass financial destruction, that is totally destructive. And to me, the real battle in capitalism is not between worker and industrial capitalist, which is the way you can read volume one of Capital. It's between those two groups and financial capital. And that's why I showed that particular quote from Marx at the end. What we have to do is tame the tendency for financial capital to massive excesses which are based on speculation rather than innovation. But at the same time, and I've got to temper this a bit, some of that uh, temptation to euphoric expectations is actually a good thing. Uh, Bill Janeway, who is one of the funders of INET, was a successful venture capitalist who did a lot of innovation in computer technology. A lot of the computers you use Bill would have actually provided the venture capital for technology. He also has a PhD from Cambridge University under Joan Robinson and Nicky Caldor. They get impeccable non-orthodox economic credentials. So Bill's written a great book called Doing Innovation, Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy. And he talks about the, the expectation capitalists have of ridiculous gains leading to this innovations, which you'd never take on if you did a sensible decision. But after it's all done, we benefit from it. Things like the internet itself, obviously. And it's, but of course, even there, um, Mariano Mazzucuto makes a very strong point. Who invented the internet? The Department of Applied Advanced Research Projects in America, the military. An academic put it together. It wasn't a capitalist invention at all. So I'm giving a very complex answer there. And I think we need to have a complex understanding of society these days, because too often the left came at it with a very mechanical position. And not only did we get it wrong, we got outfoxed by the right. Now, in many ways, we need to be smarter than the right and more aware of the strengths of capitalism as well as its weaknesses if you're going to be successful in reform. So, I hope that's an OK answer. Yes. Um, I, have a, I have a question yeah. that I wrote down. Because um, I can see why uh, private companies would take on uh, huge amounts of debt uh, trying to, like uh, in the market, to get uh, to get profits, yeah. but if you see in the United States, then the middle class and the worker mm. working class, they, they haven't had a real uh, real wage increase, mm. you know, uh, in real prices mm. uh, for a long time. But still, their debt has mm. risen. So why is private persons taking up huge amount of yeah. private debt when they don't have the the capital to to back it up? Yeah, I, um, I'll show that this is the, probably the best chart to show the scale of debt that's been taken on. And I think that's really because 
people fell for the Ponzi scheme of rising house prices. If you look at the level of private debt in America back here, which was starting at about 33% of GDP after the Second World War, about one half to one third of that was household debt. So 20% business, 10% household debt. Fast forward up to here, and more, by that stage, business debt was about about 90% of GDP, or 80%, 90% of GDP. Household debt was 40%. This huge rise here is almost entirely a rise in household debt. Now, what's going on during that period is people being persuaded that they can all get rich by selling second-hand houses to each other. Now, the only way you get richer out of selling houses to somebody buying it off you when you borrowed money to buy it is they borrow money, more money than you did to buy it in the first place. So as long as the money supply is expanding with that debt bubble, then you will have rising house prices and people get seduced into it. It's very much the case in my own country, Australia. I think it's the case in Norway as well. So that's why they got into those huge amounts of debt. But you then have to look at, well, whose interest was in to generate that debt? And really, it's households don't, in general, benefit from rising house prices. You people are losing, as you know. Okay. The people who benefit are bankers and real estate agents. They're the ones who make money. The bankers produce more debt. They, they get richer by producing debt. The real estate agents make money off the margin of turnover. So that political groups dominate the pressure for households to take on the debt. And then we tend to treat banks like we treat doctors. We used to anyway, because there's a sense of trust is an essential part of a banking system. If you go to a doctor and say, the doctor says, take this pill because it's good for your condition, you don't think, why is the doctor telling me that? Unfortunately, the bank says, take this debt on because you can buy the house and don't worry if you can't afford the repayments now because you can sell it for twice as much money in seven years' time. We also trust that and we get caught in a Ponzi scam. So I think you have to really attack the purpose of finance to see where this has come from. And it's the financial sector pressuring that on the public, the public falling for it, but it's the, it's the institutional arrangements of society that make that possible. And that's why I want to have controls on the amount of lend money, money that banks can lend to finance property purchases, which is one of the attenuating methods you might be able to use. But definitely I blame the financial sector itself for selling the whole message, and they're back doing it again. Yes, questions? Yeah. I'm going to walk closer. I've got two reasons. I've got a bad hearing, and I had a microphone. Okay. Uh, okay. After my experience in Australia, I don't underestimate the capacity of governments to restart housing bubbles after they fail. So we certainly we restarted the bubble as in Australia back in 2008 by reintroducing a boost for so-called what they call the first home owners boost, which is giving money to first home owners, which they then take to a bank and lever up and give to the seller. So I call it the first home vendors boost. So governments can restart bubbles. Now having said that, if I go back and take a look at that particular set of slides for Norway, that's, that's your house price level. That, to me, s s can't be sustained. If you've tripled house prices in 15 years, and that's compared to consumer prices, then you're probably pretty close to triple them in terms of incomes as well. So it is an unsustainable trend at that level. It has to break. It appears to be breaking a bit now. The data I have from the BIS, let's get past the, uh, that's the Norway data. The data from the BIS implies you now, as of 2012, you had decelerating mortgage debt, which should mean your house prices are going down right now. now. I don't have data going out that far, as you can see from the BIS, but I think your house prices are starting to fall. If that's happening, then you're going to get people complaining to the government saying, help, our house prices are falling. Please help them rise again. They, what I would be doing as a political group is getting out there and lobbying to get the, get the government out of asset markets. Stop the government trying to boost asset markets. If you look at what's happened in England, the English government has introduced what they call help to buy. Now, I nicknamed it help to sell. Okay? Give money to first-time buyers, leave it up with bank debt, continue driving house prices higher. That's the last thing you need. 
So in many ways, a big political issue, particularly for the youth today, is to fight the house price bubble lobbies in each of your countries. So when it starts to break down, and it would be breaking down now, then you're going to get a decline in your economic growth coming out of that to some extent. Less in Norway than in America because you are not as debt dominated as America is, even though you have a higher level of debt to GDP from what I've seen. Uh, because of your oil revenue, I expect, and the strength of your industrial sector. So you have a bit of a slowdown, but not necessarily a brutal one. And in that situation, your government is more likely to try to reach for something like an asset price boost to try to stimulate the economy again. So I can see stagnation rather than a crash coming out of all those dynamics. Um, but in that stagnation, the political battle you need to fight is to oppose people trying to restart house price rises. I hope that's the best, best I can do with that. Only having checked into the data yesterday for Norway. Any more you want to ask? Or? Uh, yeah, I just wondered um, growth on a global scale. Yeah. This growth, I mean, uh, like growth in material growth. Yeah. Do you th are you one of those that think it's sustainable? No, no, no. Yeah. But how can you, how can you solve something like that on a global scale? Because every country is just yeah. uh, forced to, to keep going. That's the, that's the great, yeah. I think we just live, we, have, we, we solve it the normal way humanity does. We collapse and then we pick ourselves up afterwards. Um, I, I certainly, having watched the debate over global warming in my own country uh, and seeing the global warming skeptics winning the political discussion, uh, I'm completely uh, lacking in any confidence of us winning the argument on science alone until after it's been proven incontrovertibly true that the globe is warming and we have to stop producing or slow down our rate of production. And um, so I think we're going to go through a crisis and recover in the aftermath. And that's what humanity, unfortunately, has always done. We've never, as a species, we've never realised a crisis is approaching and done, taken measures to attenuate it before the crisis occurs. We charge through the crisis, collapse, and hopefully in the aftermath pick up the pieces. And that's what I think we'll do in ecological terms as well as economic ones. Steve, you're talking about the ecological yeah. crisis now. The, we're just we're not going to manage the no. break. I mean, just going the, to the, crash the, into the yeah. The best work on this was done by the Limits to Growth Group back in 1972. Uh, if, you, if you haven't read it, please get a copy of the Limits to Growth. Get the ancient 1972 one if you can. There's a 2004 update as well. That was done by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology group that gave us system dynamics to begin with. So the program that did that were, were the very first system dynamics programs. And uh, Randers, I think Randers is Swedish? I'm not sure. Randers is one of the two surviving members of that team, met at the two Meadows and Randers. And I met Randers about three years ago and he said he was optimistic in 72 that if they could actually get the people to realise the dangers by 75, we could continue growing indefinitely. And he said, well, it's 25, 30 years later, we haven't done it, he expects overshoot and collapse. And uh, I still think that's the most likely outcome. You can have growth without, you can have technical, we'll, we'll never have a no technical change economy. And I'd never want to have one. Because if there's any defining feature of humanity, it's innovation. Okay? If you have to think what defines a spider, it's biting, it's poisoning things and spinning webs. What defines humanity, it's innovation. So innovation will always be part of our spirit. But we have to realise we also live on a planet with a fine size subject to the laws of thermodynamics. And there's a beautiful uh, little critique of conventional economics done by a physicist in a blog called Do the Math, which I highly recommend looking at. And the title is called Finite Physicist Meets Exponential Economist. Do take a look at it. And this physicist explains the laws of thermodynamics to this apparently quite famous economist who had no idea of the laws. 
And uh, the guy was saying, if you could have indefinite economic growth, you saw no problem with that. And then the physicist said, well, if we maintain the current trends of energy growth because of the second war and the generation of waste energy more than the amount we actually put into production, then on current trends in, in I think in, and, in 250 years, the temperature of the planet will exceed the boiling point of water. And that's without any global warming. That's just waste heat. And within 500 years, it'll exceed the surface of the, the sun. And then he asked the economist whether he thought you could have indefinite e economic growth anymore. So ultimately, we, we have to grow within those constraints of the planet while we produce on the planet. But at the same time, I'm going to sound a bit sci-fi here, but I, I really admire what Elon Musk is doing in trying to build the capacity to mine asteroids. Because ultimately, the problem we have is we produce on the biosphere. If we can produce off the biosphere, we don't have that problem. And ultimately, we have to achieve something like that because we know in about 1.8 billion years' time, the sun will be, the diameter of the sun will be slightly larger than the orbit of Earth. So if we actually want life to continue on this planet, and I don't just mean human life, I mean life in general, we ultimately have to innovate that far as well. So I'm not in favour of a zero growth economy. Uh, I'm, I'm in favour of a zero uh, imposition on the, on the ecosphere economy. But we have to maintain innovation and we have to continue looking to the stars. Great. Uh, we're starting to come to our close. So uh, do you have a question? And uh, anyone else has questions should ask, uh, should put up your hand while he's... Uh, no, I'll walk with my microphone. I'll pick it up for yeah. anyone. But no, this guy first. He was first. And then yeah. we'll take this guy. And if there's anyone else, then you should give a signal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, my question is, uh, where does money actually come from? As far as I can see, it's created in your account when you take it below, mm -hmm. and people might yeah. in the banks. Yeah. Where is the interest from? from? Is that well, created? But, 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 yeah, this, this is one little problem that a lot of people had in trying to understand the argument of how many borrow money, repay and make a profit. And if you, if you <coughs> literally speaking, the, the simplest basis in which money is created is governmentary bookkeeping. You have somebody, you might even trust this guy, the banker, you know, and he says, well, here's a loan I'm going to give you, uh, and you can take that and spend, and you won't get this amount of money. Well, that creates the money, the liability and the asset expanding to create the money. So that's the creation process. But he said, you've got to pay the interest on it. Now, he gave you, say, a loan of $100. And people think, well, he's giving me $100, and he wants 105 back, and I can't do that. That's, that's a typical way of thinking that a, a lot of post Keynesian economists had for a while. What they're confusing is the loan is at $100, okay, the interest payment is $5 per annum, okay, and when you borrow the money, you will spend it in the economy, turn it over, and make a profit out of the turnover. Now, if you borrow $100, generate $300 worth of trade per annum out of that, that's why the time units are very important. Make pay workers 250 make a profit of 50, paying in five is not a problem. So interest comes out of the turnover process, and so does profit. And that's another reason why it's really important to learn the type of techniques that Toronto Grayson's department teaches at System Dynamics to understand capitalism, because without that capacity to think in a dynamic sense, you'll make those sorts of logical errors all the time. And uh, last question, I didn't see anyone else. Uh, <coughs> what kind of permission the capital of the government? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was wondering this idea about uh, the humanity taking themselves up after a crisis. Do you think it's a dangerous idea to kind of promote? Because I'm not people, like, they, I don't know, but yeah. uh, like, because the people that's really passionate about the change in society, yeah, and yeah. they make it like become so self employed in the No, I, I think it's extremely important to protest and to fight and make a new and all those things that I had a great time doing when I was your age as well, and I'm still getting away with it. <laughs> um, but also a bit of realism about if you fail, it's not because you fail, it's because humanity's got such an overwhelming tendency to do that that resisting it is almost impossible. But if you don't resist and put alternatives forward now, people won't consider them after the event. One of the scariest books I've read is a book by an English comedian called Ben Elton. Do you know the name at all? Ben Elton? He has a book called Blind Faith. 
is a vision of a post-apocalyptic London after the global warming. It's called the Hesiano Risen, and London is now an archipelago. We've got to sail to get from one suburb to another. It's his vision of a post-global warming London, and it's terrifying. It combines Britney Spears <laughs> with the absolute worst of American evangelicalism and a fascist dictatorship. And I think it's highly feasible that a society like that could happen. But the best prevention for that is people like yourselves lobbying for a better society, but in the knowledge that you might have to do that path we go through a crash rather than before. Okay. Uh, Steve, uh, it's been a uh, great having here. For what it's become kind of a tradition that we forget uh, to buy a present for our uh, for our speakers. So you are uh, very lucky uh, <laughs> because we actually remember this time. But uh, I'm going to give you this, and um, it's it's Henry Gibson because uh, he's Norwegian, and we were actually going to give you red wine, but then we realized you are going to fly to Oslo uh, tomorrow morning. This is a dangerous sign of good thinking in advance. Yeah, <laughs> so, and then you have to drink it right away, and it that should be up to you. So this is uh, this is the present you can bring on the plane. But I would like you to, I'm going to give you this present, but I would also like you to say two words about how, uh, how in, with your projections, yeah. how far in advance can, advance can you predict the crisis? And then we should also, to finish on like a positive note, uh, what should we as political activists, uh, yeah, so, some advice, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and if you do that, you're going to get this <laughs> I Again, back to that point about prediction, I can't predict the timing of things like an earthquake, but what I can say, when you've got a level of debt like we've accumulated now, and again, to bring that back <coughs> into perspective again, there's no way that uh, we're going to get out of a crisis like this by continuing on a borrowing path, borrowing money trend. So we might turn around here and rise for a couple of years, but the, the, there's such a level of potential corporate failure and personal failure in the levels of debt that are caught up there that I think it will die within a couple of years. And then there'll be another attempt to revive and another death and another attempt to revive. And with this much of a debt burden on the economy, and it is a debt burden, this, this is the important thing, the reason conventional economists ignore it is to say, well, if you repay the debt, somebody else can spend the money. Not when you're repaying a bank. Because when you repay a bank, you take money out of circulation. Okay? You reduce the amount of money in the economy. You don't give it to somebody else to spend. You reduce the amount of money in the economy. So that's why they've been trapped for 25 years in Japan now in this situation. So I think they can keep on pushing it forward with a level of stag stagnation unemployment barely falling or actually rising most of the time and that can go on indefinitely until unfortunately normally a fascist government takes over and refuses to pay the debt and causes a boom which is what happened in the Great Depression in, in Germany which is what scares the shit out of me watching what's happening in southern Europe right now so your best thing I think is to, is to take the fight to the financial sector say we've got to have a tame financial system okay? to actually collaborate with industrial capitalists and, work and, and unions because it's the industrial side we need to strengthen against the financial side, and a campaign for debt abolition, writing off debt, getting rid of, literally writing the debt down because ancient Mesopotamian societies realised this. My, my good friend Michael Hudson, as well as being a great economist, is also a great archaeologist. And looking at Babylonian society, he found there were cuneiform tablets describing process is using fractions of course to show it with rising level of debt just doing this exponential level of debt and then showing agricultural productivity rising like an S, like an elongated S and levelling out and then showing at some particular point you cut the debt back to zero and the whole thing can start again. So they institutionalised debt abolition because they realised the tendency for debt to grow exponentially when productivity grew more slowly and therefore they had to abolish it and that means we put the political power in the hands of debtors rather than the hands of creditors. So that political shift is what you guys need to campaign for. And can I have my book now? Yeah. <laughs> Great idea. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much.